Welcome back. We're talking about sensation and perception for this lesson. Um, so this is about really the idea that we bring in information from the world around us and then we perceive that information, right? That's sort of the, uh, the division there, right? So we have stimuli that bring stuff in and that causes reactions. And, you know, of course, some of the theories of psychology are based around how we interpret that information. And then we'll talk a little bit about when the information itself is being produced by ourselves, uh, maybe through dreams or waking dreams or uh, forced dreams in the case of meditation or drugs. Um, but, you know, what messages can be received? Well, almost any information, really, uh, as long as it causes some sort of reaction. So a stimulus is just something that, you know, influences our behavior, conscious experience, that's our thoughts, emotions, right? Um, so that can be something you see, hear, feel, taste, smell, um, even think up, right, or imagine. Um, you know, with light, you know, we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So we, we think a little bit about light stimuli, and that's very obvious because we're very visual creatures. So a lot of this biology can be explained pretty uh, aptly through the workings of the eye, right? We see an apple, um, right, that goes through our, our cornea, right, uh, into the, the lens area, where that, you know, sort of uh, light information gets passed on to the optic nerve and sent on to the, the larger uh, system, right? This is done through those cones and rods. And we'll talk about that a little bit. The cones are basically, you know, the sort of uh, color receptors and the rods are the more black and white sort of receptors. So always, people are always talking about cats have more rods than cones and that's why they can see in the dark better, right? Uh, there's various parts of that eye though um, that communicate with each other. The main... Uh, a piece of the puzzle that's important in terms of transmitting that information is the optic nerve, of course. Um, the thing on the bottom there relates to how the light coming into your eye is a little bit more complex than you would imagine. It's not just an image uh, focused there. It's sort of flipped and uh, controlled by the muscles of the eye and whatnot. Um, so that little thing on the bottom of the screen, based on uh, how big your uh, display is, uh, you may not see the blind spot written if you or a certain distance from the screen. So it's a little trick you can try yourself. Um, but anyways, this light is what's focused, you know, on the sort of back of the eye, uh, where those rods and cones are, and they pick up the information and transmit that through the uh, optic nerve, of course. Jung Holm Helmholtz uh, was a, a theorician who basically argued that there's three kinds of these color uh, cones that are sensitive to different ranges of the wavelengths of light. Um, light, of course, has different, you know, it's a spectrum of light, right? There's different wavelength there. Um, so that uh, image there is basically a test of um, color blindness using these three kinds of cones um, that may be picking up different types of light. So it's called the trichromatic, tri meaning three, uh, by Jung Helmholtz, uh, who uh, uh, came up with that sort of idea. Uh, this does affect a certain number of people. It is passed on through genes, of course. Um, you know, more males than females, which uh, there's different arguments as to why that may be. Um, you know, evolutionary psychology may argue that, you know, men needed to make the fine grain distinctions at night. They were hunting. Um, who knows? It's fun to think about that stuff, though. Uh, with this sort of vision comes sort of uh, tomfoolery, if you will, or ways to manipulate how we uh, perceive things. So remember, it's the light coming in, that's the sensation, and the perception is the interpretation of that. So these uh, manipulations of this, like the Ames room there, where the guy seems the full size of the child, is really um, an object of us interpreting that room uh, improperly, right? It's, it's fooling us. So the lines at the top are making you uh, perceive uh, different lengths when they may not be, right? Um, so these sort of uh, things can test our limits, if you will, uh, based on the the misinformation that we perceive based on our uh, sensory information, right? Another type of sensory information, of course, is sound, right? So there's sound waves go into the ear and we hear it at different, you know, uh, loudnesses and pitches, um, you know, within that cochlea uh, ball uh, of liquid basically containing little hairs, right? And when the sound vibrates the liquid, the liquid causes little waves inside, you know, that 
uh, transmit those wave patterns to the hairs and then the hairs are connected to your uh, neurons basically that then transmit through the nerves through uh, to the spinal cord maybe um, but I think in the ears case it goes directly probably to the brain right it's very close there probably doesn't have to go through the spinal cord itself right so these different you know sounds we call maybe pitches right by um, the frequency of that right so a sound wave that goes through that cochlear fluid um, affects those hairs and then we perceive the different pitch that we hear um, you know and people think that maybe there's groups of hairs that respond to different types of vibrations and all of this um, there's different sort of complexities here um, with the highest frequencies maybe vibrating um, different hairs in different ways um, anyways and that sends information to our brain differently and we interpret it differently so there's a lot of complexities there one of the more interesting ones I think is how that cochlear fluid actually hardens over time so if you're you know 15 years old you love roller coasters if you're 50 years old I'm not there yet guys but when I'm 50 years old I may not like roller coasters as much because that fluid hardens and the internal parts aren't as fluid literally um, so you feel the uh, imbalance of the roller coaster going upside down a little bit more dramatically. Um, so it also uh, affects your balance perceptions as well, not just hearing. They're all sort of connected. Pain is one that we think about a lot in terms of receptors, right? So we receive pain um, in some way. It travels probably through our brain stem, um, through the spinal cord, right? Through these peripheral receptors. Uh, gate theory or pain gate theory uh, is the idea that we can shut this process down or we can shut down these nociceptors uh, that transmit this pain. Um, so there'll be a display of this in a second. Basically endorphins can uh, mitigate or block the reception of pain messages. Um, in some cases this goes awry, uh, like in the case of phantom limbs where you feel or someone may feel a pain in a limb that no longer exists. Um, so those sort of uh, lock and key mechanisms are turned on um, when they should be turned off, um, which is unfortunate, right? So you see here how the endorphin receptors basically are inhibiting the firing uh, or stopping the transmission from going down that axon, um, specifically here of the, the slower pain receptors. Uh, there's these fast pain and slow pain receptors. Um, you know, that act uh, basically in different sort of uh, ways for different types of pain. Uh, so, you know, think of this as sort of a regulatory system um, that drugs may actually affect. So they may mimic this in endorphin sort of effect that uh, blocks or caps off the pain that we feel. Anyways, taste and smell is another one, uh, an important one to me, being a little bit of a foodie. Um, but of course we have taste bud receptors all over our cell, uh, tongues, the cells there uh, um, react to different sorts of chemicals basically. Um, so salty sort of chemicals react to different taste buds and you know we have different taste buds for different things. Um, and then they sell, say smell is very related to taste and that's because we, we smell the airborne par particles or the, the airborne elements of the uh, the things we're eating, right? So um, there's a little bit of popcorn or buttery popcorn uh, in the air, and that's why we smell it, and that affects our taste. Um, I always think about this when I go in the bathroom. There's actually airborne molecules that you're smelling in there, <laughs> which might be a little disturbing. So this causes emotional reactions, especially after what I just said, maybe the next time you go to a public restroom. This also works in uh, beneficial ways for, you know, mate selection and reproduction uh, because these smells can also come in the form of pheromones, right? So these chemicals that relate to attraction or, you know, the lack of attraction. Sometimes you smell somebody that you know you're definitely not attracted to, um, and that can be for a variety of reasons. Uh, women can actually smell how symmetric guys are, um, which is an interesting finding. Uh, men aren't as good as picking up uh, physiological symmetry cues, uh, but they may also uh, correlate their attractiveness visually with their scent um, sort of reception or perception. So we interpret all this based on the idea that, you know, a certain amount of this chemical, a certain amount of this uh, sensation is happening for us to perceive it, right? So this 
threshold idea is basically just saying, and the whole uh, field of signal detection theory, the idea of signal detection theory is saying that, you know, when you uh, smell something, there has to be a certain amount of that stimulus present to reach a certain threshold. And once it reached that sort of absolute sensory threshold, we start to get um, a more accurate perception that it's present, right? So that could be a smell and that could be light. Um, so when they do this test, they may have you stare at a screen and you know, once you reach that 50% accuracy of seeing if it's, it's there, um, you know that's the lowest level that that stimulus could be there for someone to be able to perceive uh, the sensory information. Um, there's different sort of aspects to this too. So you know, that could be vision or smell. With vision, we have the feature detection idea that we're, we're looking at different uh, patterns uh, when we see things and putting things together, right? So we perceive a pattern um, based on what information is provided, right? So uh, in the left case, the cat and the hat, uh, the, the A's and the C and the H and all that um, can be, you know, basically almost anything, but we create the solution based on the surroundings. Um, and psychologists have a lot of theories for why we do this. If you think back to gestalt, they, you know, think the sum is more than the parts, right? Um, so we, we look at overall patterns. And uh, Gestalt would argue that, you know, sometimes this works in a top-down sort of way. Top-down being that we have ideas about things and we put the pieces together based on our ideas. Uh, Bottom-up being, you know, putting the pieces together and then making some, um, you know, conclusion based on the pieces uh, versus bringing something to the table. So Gestalt, uh, of course, psychologists investigate this through looking at things like proximity, proximity similarity, continuation, uh, closure, which is how we connect things, uh, like with the hot dog on the left and the right, uh, and good figure or sort of an accurate or uh, correct representation, right? Um, some of these apply to things outside of vision. These are all vision examples here. Um, so, you know, you can see sort of the um, continuation or similarity um, sort of combine in that X and O one. Uh, and then of course the hot dog one I love just because I like hot dogs. But this can work with other things, not just vision basically. Um, there can be a lot of different things. So the first one of course is proximity. Uh, the second one is similarity. The third one is really that continuation. And then we have a uh, sort of a closure thing going on there um, with the uh, Apple and uh, Abe Lincoln. And then the good figure in the last example there, E, um, sort of explaining what could be uh, present, but we don't assume it's present. Um, with the bottom picture saying we could have some sort of weird red shape, but we don't assume that's what's going on there. Anyways, uh, depth perception is something that will definitely be on your quiz for y'all paying attention. Uh, we have a lot of different cues, monocular, binocular cues, depending on... Uh, you know, whether we're using one in monocular, two in binoculars to um, sort of figure out what's going on. You know, of course, uh, you know, the convergence, you know, uses both eyes. So those are really relying on the, the distance where the eyes have to converge to meet the object, right? So if something's right in front of you, like your finger, if you hold your finger or your pen in front of your face, it's converging very close. So you know it's near if you, uh, and those images are very different, right? You're, your left eye is looking at just your knuckle, let's say, if you're using your left hand and one of your left fingers, and your right eye is seeing just the uh, inner part of the finger. The further you take that finger away from your face, the more you see the same thing, uh, right? Uh, and that same picture then tells your brain that the thing is far away. Anyway, so there's different sort of ways to look at that. There's object size, linear perspective, all sorts of things um, in terms of how our eyes figure out you know, depth. Uh, these are some of the sort of classic ones that I like, uh, especially the sort of curvy lines of C. Um, to, they're obviously not curved, but they appear a little bit more bowed than they should. Um, same thing with something like H, you know, um, the height versus width of the hat. These, these weird um, cues, uh, uh, sensory-wise, make our perception variable. Moving from the sort of basics of this to, you know, a little bit more psychological, some of this stuff can then, you know, uh, come up in our dreams, and our sleep. Um, so we can actually perceive things uh, or imagine things that 
then end up in our cognitive sort of data bank, if you will. Um, so, you know, when you dream, you're perceiving parts of the world around you just encoded through your memory. Um, some of it's the manifest, some of it's the latent. The manifest, when we look at dream interpretation, is the actual objects, right? So if you see a dog in real life and then a dog appears in your dream, that's manifest. Where latent would be what that dog means to you. Is it, you know, aspirations? Is it um, regrets? Uh, maybe you bought a dog and the dog keeps chewing up your furniture. Uh, maybe there's something there. Um, but it's sort of your perceptions of what those imaginary sensations are uh, that some people like to study. Um, in some cases, those can be negative, right? So nightmares are something that's under study, especially with people that suffer from PTSD. Nightmares are the sort of fueling agent of uh, PTSD. If you shut down nightmares, a lot of PTSD symptomology goes away. Um, but there's other sort of interesting things like uh, night terrors, which are you know a little bit more severe nightmares, uh, and then things like sleepwalking and talking in your sleep that some of you may actually do, um, and can be very interesting if you think about you know sensations of seeing, touching, feeling, um, but not being cognitively present for those things. Uh, this can also take the form of a daydream, right? So um, your consciousness can drift or you can perceive things in ways that uh, may not be realistic. Sigmund Freud, of course, talked about this a little bit, you know, explained them as sort of unconscious drives reaching that sort of conscious uh, level of awareness. Um, people can force this in a way, or maybe not force is a strong word, but <laughs> encourage this through things like meditation, right? So Buddhism and other religions uh, encourage you to reach or um, or aspire a transcendental sort of state, right? Uh, which is above and beyond uh, what we think of as normal consciousness. Um, so they imagine themselves maybe on a cloud or something looking down on their um, life or behavior or psychology or whatever that is. Um, a little bit more Western version of this you'll see pop up is mindfulness. Um, so there's research on mindfulness and the benefits of mindfulness at work and in sports and things like that. Um, but it's basically living in the present, right? So um, being consciously aware of what's going on, um, which is related to perception, but it's more about um, changing the way you perceive the stimuli, um, and in some cases maybe uh, envisioning stimuli that then change motivations and maybe even affective reactions to your environment. Some people can force this on you uh, through things like hypnosis, and this has been a study for a long time, so that this uh, reaction to the environment or a, um, an altered state of consciousness that um, makes you very susceptible to suggestion. Um, so, you know, you can see things which are confusing, so these hypnotic hallucin hallucinations um, can be very interesting if you ever see somebody be hypnotized, um, they can be convinced there's spiders around or um, or a friendly dog that they're petting, um, but it's not really there. So the idea that you can perceive something even though the stimulus is not present um, just through susceptibility um, or suggestion is uh, very interesting. Um, of course, they can also be controlled to do things if that's sort of the idea of it. All of this started with a guy named Mesmer. So the original hypnosis was really called Mesmerism. Um, and he used sounds and magnets and things to create sort of this uh, hypnotic state. Um, he thought it was the magnets, uh, whereas it may have been sort of the um, relaxation and um, psychological sort of manipulation of uh, the person's consciousness that creates this uh, suggestive state that they're in. And some people, of course, do this uh, with drugs, right? So drugs are a, a producer of altered consciousness. Um, through, of course, the biological um, stuff that we talked about, you can see that hallucin hallucinogens, uh, depressants, all of those have different sort of effects on our consciousness. Um, so people with maybe um, fast-moving minds uh, may be drawn towards depressant to sort of slow them down or ease their anxieties, um, but these sometimes turn into substance abuse issues. Uh, that's about one in four people right now. Uh, with men being uh, about twice as likely to get a substance abuse problem, um, you know, deadening those sensations for some reason. Um, however, African Americans seem to be buffered a little bit from this. Um, they are less likely uh, than sort of the majority of members currently to abuse these sorts of drugs. 
um, which is good. But uh, men, unfortunately, uh, abuse them more. Uh, but remember, this is more of a, an altered state again, uh, changing perceptions through some sort of sensory induction um, to then maybe lessen other sensory signals. Anyways, hope this was entertaining. Uh, see you next time.